Welcome to week number seven. Can you believe that we have already gone through six weeks of this year and we're week number seven? Let's go ahead and pick up in Mark chapter seven. This is what we're doing, a chapter a week. Instead of studying 10 chapters a week, we're studying one and we're learning it thoroughly. This is another great chapter with miracles in it, but it starts off with a little bit of negativity because we're seeing some religious leaders confront Jesus on something that's pretty silly. But let's look at it. One day, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They came to see Jesus, but they came with, different, with a different motive than most people came to see Jesus with. A lot of people came because they needed miracles or they wanted to hear his teachings. They came to criticize him. They were religious leaders. They were religious but they weren't disciples, they weren't saved, and it, no, and it looks like they had no love in their heart. This is what they noticed. They noticed that some of the disciples failed to follow the Jewish ritual of hand washing before eating. Perspective is so important. What are you noticing? Instead of noticing that Jesus was raising the dead, walking on water, setting people free and healing them, or noticing his great teachings, they were looking to notice something he was doing wrong or his disciples were doing wrong. That is what a spirit of religion will do to us. It'll make us feel like we're not good enough. It'll make us super critical and judgmental of those around us. And if you've ever been in a religious church or religious atmosphere, you never feel like nothing you do is ever good enough because your focus is on yourself. Jesus knew that we were all sinners and none of us could save ourselves by our own self-righteousness or by trying to obey the law perfectly because we all fall short of the glory of God. What they were trying to do here was catch Jesus in breaking the law. The truth was they caught his disciples breaking a law that they made up. We start off with 10 commandments. They ended up with 613 commandments. On the Sabbath, the Word of God says in, in, in one of the commandments, it says, Thou shalt keep the Sabbath holy. They came up with 39 more <laughs> commands to keep the Sabbath holy. This is one of the commands they came up with. On the Sabbath, you cannot spit on the ground because you'd be guilty of plowing the, the soil. They also came up with this law. You're not, you, you're, you cannot swat a fly because you'd be guilty of hunting. <laughs> they were coming up with all these Jewish traditions or man-made laws and they were confronting Jesus on it. Now Jesus responds in a pretty harsh manner, not because he's trying to be mean. I believe he's trying to shake them up because they think they're righteous. There's one thing where you know you're a sinner and you know what you're going to get is mercy and love and forgiveness from the Lord. But being self-righteous they thought they were right with God. And Jesus was now going to shake them up and let them know, you guys are so far away. Imagine living your whole life trying to do your best to obey these 613 laws and acting like you're actually obeying them and you're really not. This is what Jesus said in verse 5. So the Pharisees and teachers of religious law asked him, why don't your disciples follow our old age tradition? And Jesus said in verse 6, Jesus replied, You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship, their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. This was the problem. No matter what religion you belong to, this is, what, this is truly what happens. They come, up with, they come up with more and more rules. And usually in cults and religious sects, they actually come up with other books <laughs> that they write. And what they do is replace the commands of the Word of God with these other books. And they idolize what they wrote over what God said. This is exactly what happened to them. <laughs> they began to idolize what they wrote and what they said and their man-made laws. And this is what it was doing. It was taking them farther and farther 
away from salvation and farther out farther away from Jesus. And Jesus woke him up and says, I look at your hearts. Outside you look beautiful. You're dressing the part. You're praying the part. You're showing up to church. But deep on the inside, you're not saved. I see your heart. You're wicked. You need to be forgiven. I came to save you. This is what Jesus said in verse 12, I mean verse 15. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. And Jesus mentions one, something again, the heart. You're concerned about eating something and defiling your soul and your spirit. You could eat a Twinkie and it might not be good for you <laughs> health-wise, but it's not gonna affect your soul. It's not gonna affect your heart. And Jesus said, I've come to change your heart. I've come to give you a new heart. I've come to save you. It's not what goes into the mouth. Now, Jesus began to go deeper. In verse 21, for from within, from, from within, out of a person's heart comes evil thoughts, sexual morality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, de deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these vile things come from within. They're what defile you. So now Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's teaching the crowd. He's addressing everyone. And this is what he's saying. What really defiles or makes a man dirty is what's on the inside. Not outside in, but inside out. Now Jesus did not mention these things to condemn them. He mentioned these things to show them a mirror. Are these things in your heart? Because if they are in your heart, I will forgive you. I'll set you free. I'll give you eternal life. Jesus came to die for our sins. That was the point of the message. These, these religious leaders thought they could be saved by their own self-righteousness, but the truth was they were ignoring where they really were because this is what was in their heart. And Jesus was showing them, on the outside you look really good, but I see what's in your heart. Understand, all God is saying, all Jesus is saying is this, just confess your sins. And if you confess your sins, I'm faithful to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Now we go into a story in Mark chapter 7 of a Gentile woman. She wasn't a religious leader. She was considered an outsider. And she comes with a totally different spirit. She doesn't come critical. She comes desperate because she needs a miracle. Her daughter is demon possessed. She heard about Jesus because... The crowds were starting to talk about him and saying, we've heard that he casts out demons. We heard that he raises the dead. We heard that he walks on water. We heard that he heals the sick. She heard about him. But there's one person I believe that, she, that really stands out in her region that began to evangelize that whole area. And in Mark chapter 5, there's a man that was demon possessed. Jesus met him a few chapters earlier. And he was so out of his mind that he lived in a cemetery. They would try to chain him up and he'd break the chains. No one could harness him. No one could control him until Jesus came. Jesus set him free from a demon called Legion. He said, because we're many. This guy was so possessed. He had an army of demons inside of him. After Jesus set him free, he was in his right mind. And he said, Jesus, can I follow you? And then Jesus says, no, stay here in this region and tell people what I've done for you. Well, this lady and the whole region started hearing about what Jesus did for him. And now she's putting two and two together. She's saying, if, he, if Jesus could set that guy free, he could set my daughter free. This is how people are going to come to Jesus. They're going to hear about him, hear our testimony, hear where we came from. Hear the breakthroughs and the things we got set free from. And as they hear it, it builds their faith. No one is ever going to believe in Jesus. No one's ever going to come to Jesus unless they hear about him. The word of God says, faith comes by hearing. Well, the little bit that she heard built her faith to help her daughter get set free. So now she comes to Jesus and she begs him, Jesus, heal my daughter. And Jesus responds, in an unusual way, I would never think that he would have said what he said, but he was using her to display what real faith looks like. 
Let's see what Jesus said. Jesus told her, first, I should feed the children, my own family, the Jews. It isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. Mm. If I was Jesus consultant, I said, Jesus, let's not use those words. They can be really offensive. <laughs> but there's a reason Jesus used these words, because he wants to show us what real faith looks like. And he's using an outsider. She wasn't Jewish. She wasn't a religious leader. She wasn't one of his inside disciples. She was somebody that everyone considered an outcast or maybe a dog. And what she does, she keeps on focusing on what she was there for. I'm here for my daughter. My daughter's demon possessed. I heard you could set her free. And she did not, uh, she did not allow herself to be offended. Be careful that you grab on to being offended and let go of your miracle. Grab on to be offended and let go of your ministry. Grab on to be offended and let go of your love. Grab on to be offended and talk yourself out of the miracle and great things God wants to do to, through, to your life and through your life. So she replied, there's a response, that's true. And she said, maybe I am a dog, maybe I'm an outsider. This is what she realized, I am a sinner. And maybe I'm disqualified from receiving anything from you based on my own merit. But Lord, even dogs, under, even the dogs under the table are allowed to eat the scraps from the children's plates. And she goes, I might be there, but if I'm a dog, at least give me some crumbs from the plates. What an amazing response. She said, I am not getting offended. I know you could heal my daughter and I could leave here without my daughter being healed. But I'm leaving here with a miracle. Jesus answered, good answer. It's an exclamation point. And he said, now go home, for the demon has left your daughter. He said, honey, that was exactly what I was looking for. That's the kind of faith that I'm looking for, that doesn't get offended, that doesn't get distracted, and continues focusing on me as your answer. The religious leaders were offended because the disciples didn't wash their hands. They had no reason to be offended. But this lady, it looks like she had a reason to be offended, but she did not let her opportunity to be offended, overcome her opportunity for her daughter to be saved and set free. And when she went home, her daughter was in her sound mind, healed by just one word of Jesus. And now we go into the final section of Mark chapter seven, where we see another miracle. A deaf man is healed. Let's take a look at this. A deaf man, verse 32, um, with a speech impediment was brought to him and the people begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man to heal him. Here we see some people that are bringing a deaf man to Jesus. And then they're praying in a sense, interceding for him, and they're saying, Jesus, will you touch him and heal him? Why was it so important for some friends or neighbors to bring this deaf man to Jesus? Because the deaf man had no faith. Because he never heard about Jesus, everyone else heard about him. But they said, this is our friend. We've heard of what, Je what, what Jesus can do. And we're believing that Jesus can set people free from demons. We're believing that he heals the sick. And we're believing that he could heal our friend from the speech impediment and from being deaf. Jesus heard their prayers. Again, don't underestimate what God can do through you, through you what he does through us. We can bring someone to church and connect them to Jesus Christ. We can pray for our sons, daughters, friends, neighbors. It might look like, no way, they're going to receive Jesus. Is it, is it possible that God could use your faith to actually bring them to Jesus? Well, we're seeing here, <clears throat> excuse me, we're seeing here that Jesus is exactly doing that. He's using their faith to heal this deaf man. And he said in verse 34, looking up into heaven, he sighed and said, be opened. Instantly, the man could hear perfectly, and his tongue was freed so he could speak plainly. Exclamation point. A miracle. How does it happen? Friends bring a friend to Jesus. They pray for him. Jesus speaks to his fr their friend. He says, be open. His ears were open. His tongue was released. Imagine his friends 
seeing him speak and hear for the first time and the joy and the excitement. And it all happened as a domino effect. They heard about Jesus. They brought their friend. Jesus touched them. But it didn't just affect him. It affected the whole community. And it all started with an ex-demon possessed man that went in that region and started telling everyone, remember, I was that maniac in the cemetery. Jesus set me free with just a word. And he, when Jesus came back for that, to that same exact region, the people were now ready to receive. But this was the conclusion in verse 37. They were completely amazed and said again and again, everything he does is wonderful. I'm so proud of you that you're continuing to grow in our daily growth book. I know it's not easy to stay consistent, but continue working on being consistent because God wants to speak to you every single day. Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. And he meant that, that every day I want to give you spiritual food. I want to help you grow. But before we end, I just want to end in prayer. Maybe today you're saying, I feel like I'm desperate. I need a miracle. Or maybe I need to be saved. I've been religious. I've been trying to save myself by my own good works. And no matter what I do, it doesn't seem like it's good enough. And the truth is, it's not good enough. We're all sinners in need of a savior. Uh, we all fall short of the glory of God or the standards of God. So salvation is simple. Jesus died, suffered and died for our sins to pay the price of the wrong we've done. He resurrected from the dead. Jesus resurrected from the dead. He's alive. He conquered death. And anyone that believes in his sacrifice for their sins and is willing to repent of their sins, acknowledge their sins and repent of their sins, will be saved by calling on Jesus. And if that's you today, I want to be saved. I, have a, I, 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 I need a miracle. I feel like, man, I've been oppressed by demons or, or I'm dealing with an impossible situation. Either one of them, today's your day. Let's pray. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I realize I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I know that no matter what I do on my own merit, my own good works, it's not good enough. I'm asking you, Lord, to save me forgive me. I make a choice today to repent and turn away from my sin and place my faith in the sacrifice that you made for me. It should have been me that died and suffered for my sins, but you took my sin to the cross and then you conquered death to give me eternal life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior and use me now to bring others to you. Just like those men brought their friend to Jesus, Use me, Lord, to bring others to you to church, bring them to study your word so they can know you and be saved and have an encounter with you just like I have today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Congratulations, you said that prayer, you're saved. And for us that are believers, let's continue studying the word and let's continue bringing people to Jesus. Don't underestimate what God can do through you. God bless you, love you.